Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> it will be a quiet talk. Can you hear me now? Yes, everybody up there, can you hear me? The far, farther out? Good, thank you. Okay, so I'm lucky enough to give you seven lectures with a total of 90 minutes per lecture, so, you know, so it's roughly 10 hours. A little more than 10 hours, actually, I'm going to spend with you. So I really hope that you're going to enjoy it. And let me start with several uh, little things, okay? So let me say I've been, uh, I've been teaching in this school 12 years ago. It was an amazing experience, and I still have people I still friend with them since then from students. And I've been doing quite a lot of those kind of schools. And what I found the hardest thing to do in this kind of school is just to actually try to measure how much you guys know and where I should start. So what I decided to do based on my experience in the past, I'm going to try to start at a very basic level. And I apologize in advance for those of you who are going to say, oh, what are you talking about? I remember in kindergarten, that was my, you know, my teacher were telling me, remember when we, we're going to do some swings and all those kind of things. So please, however, I kind of promise you that if you don't give up, Toward the end, I'm almost sure that you're going to ask anybody going to learn something new from what I'm saying today, okay? Please ask questions. I mean, it's amazing how much I love to answer questions. I really love to talk, and you can tell. I, I'm, I'm really a, a talker. But I really like you to ask questions. Here it might be a little bit embarrassing, many people, but ask me, you know, I'm here just for you. It's an amazing thing. Listen, think about it, okay? Nobody pays me. Well, they pay my flight ticket. But nobody pays me. And I come here for the whole week. All I want to do is just talk to you. I also want to go to the beach. But other than that, I just want to be here for, for talking to you. And when you see me alone and I'm lonely and sad, come and talk to me, okay? <laughs> Ask me questions. And I love to talk about anything in physics that I do know about, okay? I don't like to talk about things I don't know. But hopefully, you know, so please. Come sit by me when you see me at lunch. Come and sit by me on dinner and breakfast when we are around in the thing. Come and talk and talk and we do some <coughs> physics. Uh, this is my email. Free, free to email me with any question if you're embarrassed or after the talk. So the plan of the, what I have to do in the seven lectures, I'm going to start with an introduction to quantum field theory. And as I said, all of you already took quantum field theory. My apologies. But however, what I found that I took quantum field theory like two times, and I only understood it when I was teaching it, okay? So it may not be so bad if you kind of hear it again and maybe hear it in, in a, a little different way with a different accent, kind of those things. So you hopefully it will be still good. So I hope to do it in two, two lectures. Then I'm going to talk about the standard model for another two lectures, and then I go into some, hopefully, a little bit deeper into flavor physics toward the end. Any questions? I, 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 I knew it's never, nobody asked question at this point, because it was so clear, right? Okay, good. So let me start with what is high energy physics, or another question is, what the hell are we doing? So why are we doing high energy physics? Or why I spend, and now it's like um, 27 years since I started my master, when I started doing like, why, what I'm doing, okay? What it is, the big picture of what, what, what we are doing, what is the part of physics that we, what we are doing is high energy physics. <laughs> Did you ask yourself this question? You should, you should. Oh, very good, very good. Because otherwise, like, <laughs> I just go and what do I do? There's some, I, oh, let's do high energy physics and you step in the room. So let's, my answer to myself, what is high energy physics? So high energy physics is to find the basic law of nature. And this is one of the things I'm uh, most proud of. Oh, shit. Not this one. This one. <laughs> okay. That's the most compact way that I can tell what I am doing, okay? And if someone asks me what I'm doing, I ask, oh, what is the Lagrangian of the standard model? Or what is the Lagrangian, basically, of nature? So what we try to do is to find the basic law of nature. And in the way that we are doing it is that I want to find the Lagrangian of nature. And if I know the Lagrangian of nature, then basically I understand nature, OK? That's actually a really important statement, OK? It's important statement because it's just the fact that we can actually do it. I mean, it's really far from trivial that we as human beings can actually see what are the law of nature. 
And it's even more far from trivial that we actually made so much progress. And we really understand nature at a very, very fundamental level. Okay? So we do have a very good answer. Okay? It's quite a good answer. And you all know what it is. It's called the standard model. Okay? And not only that we have an answer, this answer is extremely elegant. I mean, the standard model, and then, as I said, I'm sure you all learn about the standard model to some extent. And we are going, I'm going to emphasize why there's so elegancy in, in this thing. It's based on axioms, just like it's almost like mathematics. You put your axioms, very, very, very diff simple things. You observe some symmetries, and you get out something that, amazing enough, explains basically almost everything that we saw in nature. There's a few things that we didn't understand yet, and then, of course, we are really excited about them, but I'm not going to get into them in these lectures. Okay? And the way we do it is the following, and I'm going to explain it in, in more detail, is it's basically like we did mechanics. And I assume that all of you took analytical mechanics. That's the assumption that I made. Okay? And at least for me, when I took analytical mechanics, that was this uh, wow feeling that I got into the lecture. And I was like this. You, you had it, this feeling when you took analytical mechanics? And the professor would start saying, oh, that's, that's the Lagrangian. And, ah! and every lecture, it was this kind of thing. So what we are doing is basically a generalization. In classical mechanics, it's kind of simple. You say, oh, I have generalized coordinate. We call them x and y. And now we do it with fields. The fields are the generalized coordinates of, of classical mechanics. And we call them phi and psi instead of x and y. But other than that, it's almost the same. Okay? And why are we doing particle physics? Why the hell we are we? I mean, I kind of include myself in all this. But why we are going and take those amazing protons and uh, accelerate them to such high energy and collide them and start seeing all the crap that come out of this. Why are we doing it? So we are not doing it because we really care so much about what's going on for this particle. We do it because we understand using particle physics, we learn the fundamental law of nature. Okay? So if someone asks me, why do you care so much what is the mass of the electron? Everybody know the mass of the electron? You should. 511. You have this feeling like if you go and you see a car with 511, yes? Yeah, okay, good. Or 137? Yes, okay. So the 511, but do I care that there, that is 511, <coughs> whatever, KV? Of course I don't. What I really care about is the fact that it's actually part of the big picture of, that it's really explained the fundamental law of nature. Good. So with these philosophical things, let me start with, again, as I said, I start with very fundamental things, and let's go back to... Uh, undergrad physics, and we ask what is mechanics. So in mechanics class, you go to the class, and the professor is telling you, so what is mechanics? Why are we doing mechanics? Because we have a question. The question is how to find x of t. We have to find the trajectory of a particle. Or more generally, we have a system with many, many particles, and we have to find the trajectories of all the particles. And if I know this function, x of t, I'm done. Or in more general, if I know the function, the many function, x i of t, I'm done. I just have to find all those functions. And moreover, once I know the trajectories of all the particles, I know every observable. I can calculate the energy, the momentum, the angular momentum, any observable that you have in mind, I can calculate once I know the trajectories of all the particles. Okay? And another very important thing that we learn in classical mechanics is that instead of for solving for x, say x1 and x2, I can define two other coordinates, q1 and q2, that happen to be, say, the sum and the difference of all those. Okay? And in, when you wear cla classical mechanics, it looks like a trivial statement, right? What is more trivial than say, oh, if I know x and y, and I know x plus y and x minus y is the same as knowing x and y, right? I hope it is a very trivial thing, and you are very familiar with it. However, it's a really deep thing, and we are going to use it a lot when we start doing particle physics, OK? So how do we solve mechanics? So you remember? That was lecture number one in mechanics course. It said, let's find x of t. And then we said, how do we actually find x of t? And the answer is as following, OK? This amazing axiom that come out of nowhere, OK? And it's called the principle of minimal action, or the Hamilton principle. And this axiom tells us something like this. It says that there is something that we call the action, and the solution is the thing that minimizes this action, OK? And that's an axiom. And amazingly enough, this axiom, we never really change it throughout all those years from, since the days of Hamilton and Euler and Lagrange that did all these things, OK? And there's only one action that describes the whole system. So this S, which is some abstract thing that's called the action, 
And it's some integral of something else that is very abstract that we call the Lagrangian. And <clears throat> then the thing that minimizes this is the solution. And in order to minimize this, we have to use the Euler-Lagrange equation. You remember all this? Yes? So is it correct what I wrote here? Is the action is the integral of L of x, x dot dt with one particle, one degree of freedom. Is it correct or did I miss something? It should be correct otherwise, you know, I, I, I spend so much time thinking about this transparency, right? But maybe it's not really correct. So what about time? Why there's no x, x dot and t? Uh. So maybe there is a mistake. So I guess you know, but you are a little bit too shy. Anybody brave enough to tell me why there's no time? Yes, I assume no explicit time dependent. Very nice. And is it justified? Why did I do it? Why do we usually do it? Because I assume conserved system. Very nice. Let me say the way I like to kind of say it is I assume a symmetry. I assume that my Lagrangian is invariant under time translation invariant. I assume that when I take my Lagrangian and do t go to t plus c for an arbitrary number c, this Lagrangian is invariant. And this, the importance of this symmetry is the fact that we have energy conservation or we have conserved system. Okay? So that was a, actually a very good thing. By the way, why I don't use have x double dot and x triple dot? You remember? Back then, Chapter one in Landau Lifshitz. Yes. So sorry. Ah, very nice. So this is always the right answer. The right answer is that I do it because it gives me the right answer, so I do it. Okay? And it sounds a little bit uh, it's called circular reasoning, okay? So Sometimes I choose my Lagrangian to be this, because if I choose it with something else, it wouldn't describe nature. So I choose the thing that actually gives me the correct answer. However, and that's a very important thing, what we find out when we do deeper and deeper physics, we find out that sometimes I actually have like real good reason. For example, for the time, why I didn't include time, there was a, re a really good reason. It was a symmetry reason, right? And it described nature. So of course I could say I didn't put time because it described nature, or that's a good answer. But then I gave you a different answer, which you can take or not, and say I impose a symmetry. I say t go to t plus c is a symmetry, and therefore there's no time explicit time dependent in this equation. Okay? Anybody know of a symmetry that forbids x double dot? Not really, actually. You can have it. You can have non-local. You you can have a thing that uh, <clears throat> it doesn't really have to be a non-local thing when you have double derivative. Have you ever thought about this when we were doing a... Uh, I want you to think about it, okay? And let's think about it. I'm not going to give you the answer. And <coughs> it's actually a really important question. So when we start doing mechanics, again, somewhere in your undergrad years, usually, that's the way it was presented, and usually we don't ask the question why, and the answer is that if I have x double dot, I don't get f equals ma, and I do want to get f equals ma, so I set it to zero, okay? Very good, so what I do after, I set my Lagrangian, I use the most famous formula in physics, right? Maybe there's more, more famous formula, like E equal mc squared, but it's a very important formula that all of you probably remember, and you use the euler Lagrange equation, and that gives me x up to initial condition. And when you give me the initial condition, you tell me x0 and v0, I solve mechanics. Okay? So we did something really nice. We take mechanics and reduce mechanics to the question, what is L? Okay? So you see something really nice the way we do physics. We take a question, which was what is x of t, and I replace this question, what is x of t, by the question, what is L? So if you tell me the, uh, the Lagrangian, I have a mechanism to get x of t, which was my original question. And that's actually many times how we make progress in science. We take one question, do something, and reduce it to another question. Very good. So how will we find what is L? Uh. So let's take an example, Newtonian mechanics. So in Newtonian mechanics, 
we choose L to be mv squared over 2 minus v of x. In mechanics, why do we choose this L? So usually the answer is because it's giving me what I want, right? But there's actually a little more into this, OK? So we use the euler lagrange equation. We plug it in, and we find, boom, f equals ma. Wow. And that was, I think, my first wow in my life when I saw this, OK? L is an input. I take L as an input, and I get f equals ma as an output, OK? And most people, I still think most people in the world think that f equals ma is the start of mechanics, right? That's how we teach most people, right? That's how you study in high school. And now we come to and say, no, f equals ma is actually an output. But still, how do we find what is this L? OK? And let me give you the following uh, statement. And the following statement is as following, that L is the more general one that is invariant under some symmetries. OK? And I'm going to discuss it a little longer. But again, we rephrase the, 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 the question. Instead of saying what is L, I said, what are the symmetries? And then if you tell me what the symmetry is, write the most general Lagrangian. And then I usually truncate it at some level. I, just, I write it to some order in some small parameters. And that's my Lagrangian. Okay. So again, let's ask the following question, which you probably asked yourself. What are the symmetry of Newtonian mechanics? So the way we do mechanics, we usually start from the Lagrangian is mv squared over 2 minus v of x, and then we get f equals ma. But can we actually get L, L equal mv squared over 2 minus v of x from symmetries? Do you know the answer? Maybe let me ask a little simpler answer. If I have a, a free particle, so let's assume I have one particle just free, no potential. What is the symmetry? So if I have a particle with just no potential, the Lagrangian is just mv squared over 2. OK? What is the symmetry? And actually, L equal mv squared over 2 can get, we can get totally just from symmetry argument. Do you know what symmetry I have to impose? Translation invariant. So translation invariant guarantee that there's no x in it. Because if I have translation invariant, x go to x plus c, tell me that the Lagrange cannot depend on x. Very good. What else? Hmm? So isotropy say, tell me that it must be proportional to the absolute value of v, not only to v. OK? So it might be proportional to v squared. OK? No t, we already talked about. Hmm? So parity, actually, we do not impose on the Lagrangian. So it's, the parity is come automatically when I say it's a function of v squared. So why I don't have v to the 4? What is the symmetry that guarantees that I don't have v to the 4? And actually, let me ask a, a little different question. So if you see, because the Lagrangian of a free particle is just mv squared over 2, a free particle has only one property, which is a mass, which is an amazing statement. Because if I looked at other things, they have many properties. Just happen to hold this in my hand. It has a lot of things. It has mass, but it also has a shape. Do you see? Does it have a shape? You look. It's, yeah? So why a fundamental particle have only mass? Why it doesn't have a shape? Why does it have other properties? Or does it? Does it? <laughs> Do we? Are you a little bit confused? I hope so. But I really, you, you see the question. The question is why a particle of only mass? Why the Lagrangian is mv squared? The over 2 is, is total normalization, right? I hope you, we all agree. So why the Lagrangian is some number times v squared? And this number is a property of a particle. Anybody? Yes. Thank you. OK. Very nice. Galilean invariance. Galilean invariance is this deep axiom of classical mechanics that tells us that all internal reference frames are equivalent. There's no experiment that we can tell, that, tell me if I'm in a different in, uh, internal frame. And therefore, it must be v squared. And if you've never done this exercise, Please do yourself a favor, please, OK? Just do this exercise, OK? It's section three in Landau leaf sheets, OK? You just go and you just do, like, it's two lines of an exercise that you prove to yourself that it must be just some number times v squared, OK? And what's happening when we give up Galilean invariant? Why do we want to give up Galilean invariant? Because of relativity. So when we give up Galilean invariant, what happened to our Lagrangian? Do we have v to the four terms? When we go to relativity, 
we have v to the four terms. So you, everything kind of fits, right? You give a Galilean invariance, you give us the fact that it's only mv squared, you see some v to the four going up. And actually, because of Lorentz invariance, you're going to have a Lagrangian of relativity, which looks a little different. OK? Good. So I hope we're all on the same page on this, how we actually do physics, OK? That's the way we like to think the way we do physics, OK? We like to do things in a very, very si simple way and start on very, very simple axiom, OK? We impose some simple axioms, some symmetries, and we got there. So now that we all, re you know, so that was the whole course in the classical mechanics. And now let's move to field theory, OK? So what is field theory? So let me start with the following question. What is a field? OK? So mathematically, a field is something that is a function of both x and t. And I call it phi. And there's actually many, many fields that we can think about. And I go over here some examples. For example, a temperature. So why the temperature is a field? Because it changes from place to place, right? So for example, when I come from uh, Ithaca in the winter, it's very cold. And I come here in the summer, and it's very hot. So it's both x and t that I change. And I get a different value. OK? And I can actually sit in Ithaca and in the summer it become warmer. Or at the same time when I'm at the same time at different axes, I do have a different value. So temperature is a field. And we call it a scalar field. Why? Because it's only a number. It's just a <coughs> number at each point. But I can also think about a vector field. For example, a wind. Why a wind is a vector field? Because at each point, I can measure the directionality of the wind. So I say, I have a wind, and the winds go in this direction, and it has the following whatever value. So that's a vector field. A mechanical string. So if you take a string, and you take a string that is in rest, and then I start moving the string, I call it a field. Because at any point on the string, it can be either up or down, so it changes with both x and t. How about the density of people? Are the density of people a field or not? It should be because it's in my list. OK, very nice. Good answer. So do you think it's a day? So let's look, for example, like we take a picture of the world right now. And there's some places that are very dense. OK, for example, New York City. Or actually, also, we are here in this room. There's a total, it's crazy dense compared to the average number of density of people, right? And two hours ago, this room was actually under dense, right? It was totally, well, I didn't really measure it, I assumed, right? It was empty, right? So the density of people, it's actually, it changes as a function of x and t. Make sense? Is it a vector field or a, or a scalar field? Scalar field, you just say the number of people, OK? But still, a little bit surprising that I talk about the density of people as a field because what is the density of people like, like here on my ear? Or <laughs> the density of people here on the top of my head? Can I talk about, can I even ask this question? What is the density of people like, again, any other, like on my finger? <laughs> so what do I actually hint in here? Why am I asking you why, where I'm going? No, it's not the scale in Vaya. No, it's not. You could. I mean, that's a very interesting thing because, you know, you have this story of Gulliver that's, you know, that you can. Yes. So, so you say, I can actually take this and then. But it's a little. What else? What, what is. It depends on the volume. So what do I really need in order for make, so, to make sense of think of density of people as, as a field? A cutoff. Very nice. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andrew took my course in Cornell last semester, but no, he knows it before that. Right. OK. It makes sense. It actually makes sense to talk about density of people only if I average over large enough volume. OK? Say, if I take some volume or surface area of, say, one kilometer squared and I average over it, then it makes sense, right? But if I go to too small of a, of a thing, I cannot make sense of it, OK? I have to average of thing that is clearly have to be much bigger than the size of a human being. Only then I can make a sense of, of talking about density of people, OK? And how informally in physics we call this uh, size, where we have to average? It's called the cutoff. And which kind of cutoff it is? It is the, thank you, Andrew, the UV cutoff, right? It's the UV cutoff. It's the cutoff of the small scale of my theory. Okay, so actually, 
Basically, all the things that I was telling you around have some UV cutoff. So what is the UV cutoff of temperature? What, at what scale I cannot talk about temperature anymore? Hmm? So <laughs> it has to be somewhat the distance between two atoms. So I have to average over large enough distance, OK? So the only the way we define temperature, I have to have many molecules within a volume in order to talk about, about temperature, right? And if I talk about mechanical string, it's the same story. I have to talk about things that are large enough. Okay? So actually, what I was about to tell you is that fields are things that change in X and T. But actually, most fields that we know about have a cutoff. They do not dare at any distance. They have a UV cutoff, so it's some small distance. I cannot talk about them anymore. And also, usually, at very, very large distance, I cannot talk about them anymore. Any field have some, it's called the IR cutoff. So the UV cutoff is the short distance, and the IR cutoff is the large distance. So what's happening? At what scale I cannot talk about things anymore? Large scale. Yes, the infrared. So what is, in terms of uh, my, say, <coughs> my temperature fields. I cannot talk about them at what scale, when they become too large. The size of the Earth, so roughly. Say, if I care about density of people, for example. So I, I could have actually talked about, because there were some people on, on the moon at some point, right? So we can actually extend it. But the point is that we, can never, we never care about things that are bigger than the size of the universe, right? Any field. I never care about things that are bigger than the, than the size of the universe. So any field actually has some UV cutoff and IR cutoff. At least in principle, we think there is. So that brings me to my last example, the electric and magnetic fields, which you're all familiar with. You study them a lot. What is the UV cutoff of the electric, electric and magnetic field? Do, do they have? Can we talk about electric and magnetic field at the size of the electron? I don't know. The electron has a size? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's the correct answer. It is, but the electron doesn't really have a size, right? So it's zero. But no, it's not really. What? Hmm? The Compton wavelength of the electron. So if we talk about empty fields, empty, uh, you know, a space just empty without sources, so the answer is, is, is really the electron. It's the size of the electron. It's not really the Compton wavelength. It's I, hope you, I, I hope you appreciate those questions. They are really, really cool questions, and they are kind of simple. And once we understand them, at least for me, it's really helped me to understand quantum field theory when I really understand those simple questions. What really tells me that somewhat my description of Maxwell equation breaks down? So when you do Maxwell equation in undergrad e and and that I really know because I was teaching it now for three years in a row, so I really understand it now. OK? So when it breaks down, when you cannot use Maxwell equation anymore, you remember that you will calculate the, en the energy that an electron gives is the integral of, the, of e squared plus b squared over 8 pi. I even remember the 8 pi. You remember this exercise you did? And you get infinity? Yes? And what you did with this infinity, you remember? Not, not. If you never saw these infinities, it's really cool. It's one of the first infinities that you ever see in your life. And many times, so I, I really want to so remember the energy. So in electromagnetism, for some reason, we call it the W, right? So the energy is e squared plus b squared over 8 pi integral over the whole volume of the system. You remember this? There's maybe some units in some, but it doesn't matter. Even the 8 pi, I shouldn't really care, but I'm just happy that I remember it. So you remember that you do this, and you ask, what is the, what is the energy associated with the electron? And the answer is infinity. You remember this infinity? Good. <laughs> what do you mean good? If you have an infinity, you cannot just keep going. It is a, it's not, uh, you have to like stop. You can't say that's good and keep going. So what was the thing that cut off this infinity? There's some UV physics. There's something that at very, very short distance tells us that Maxwell equations are not the correct description of nature. Maxwell equations are the correct description of nature only at some large scales. And at some small scales, it breaks down. So what is the scale where Maxwell equations cannot describe physics and we need something else to take over? 
Hmm? The Planck scale is, is definitely correct, but there's actually a scale that is much bigger than the Planck scale where things are break down. Okay? And <coughs> I don't know if I should give you the answer because I really want you to think about it. The thing that happened is that when you come to a very, very short distance, quantum mechanics become important. And when quantum mechanics become important, you cannot use classical Maxwell equation, you have to use quantum mechanics. And the size when quantum mechanics become important is roughly one over the mass of the electron. Okay? And I never know how, it is, how much it is in, in meters. Anybody remember 1 over m e in meters? Yeah, yeah. But we have to remember these numbers. It's amazing I don't remember this number. We really should. Okay. So let's do the following. So the Planck scale is 10 to the minus 35 meter, right? And the mass of the electron is MeV. The Planck scale is 10 to the 19. What? Actually, so it's very small. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that it's not zero, and it's a cutoff for my theory, OK? So what I wanted to take out of this is that every field theory have a cutoff. And <coughs> we have to understand that every physics that I do actually depends on my cutoff. And that's, again, a very important lesson that when you start doing quantum field theory and you get all those crazy infinities and you start worrying about them, you have to understand, yes, that's actually because there's a cutoff. Okay? And <coughs> actually what we understand now, we understand that, fi that fields are fundamental. In the old days of, of Maxwell, we say, hey, that's how it works. We have before Maxwell, we had like electrons, and the electrons are the source, and the field are some mathematical trick that we use. You remember the way we learn it, and that's, I'm sure you learn it somewhere in high school, right? In high school, you say the force is QQ over R squared, and then you say, oh, let's take one Q out, and let's call it a field, and the field is Q over R squared, and the force is Q times the field. Such an amazing mathematical trick, right? And it was roughly Maxwell and some other people around his time that say, no, the fields are not just bare mathematics. They are fundamental physics. They are real physics in the field. So fields are something very physical. It's not just a mathematical trick that we use in high school. It's also a mathematical trick to be used in high school. But it's fundamental physics, it's very, very fundamental. And since fields are fundamental, we really have to try to understand them. And that's what we are going to do next. OK. <clears throat> so let's take an example of a, of a classical field theory. And that's the electromagnetism. It's not a simpler example, but it's the example that you are familiar with. Okay? So you take the electric field, and you find that you have a wave equation. Okay? And you solve those wave equations, and you find that the electric field is given by A cosine omega t minus kx plus phi zero. Phi zero is some, uh, you have to give me the initial condition, and also A, you have to give me the initial condition, and then I solve it. Okay? And let me emphasize what I mean by solving it, because this is clearly not a solution. The solution has to do with the, all the initial condition that you are giving me. Only then I really know the solution. What I really do when I say I solve, I solve Maxwell equation, what I did is the following. Here, I have E is a function of two variables. It's a function of x and t. And on this side, you see this is a function of only one variable. It's a function of omega t minus kx. So when I say I solve the field equation, what I do, I take a function that is a function of two parameters, and I reduce it to become a function of one parameter. It's clearly not the full solution. The full solution is that I know everything. So in order to know everything, I need the initial condition. And the initial condition would be A for any omega. So it's not only A. I should have write A of omega. For any omega, you have to give me what is the amplitude, and then I really solve it. Okay? So just to remember that when I say I solve an equation, it's just reduce it from two parameters into one parameter. Okay? So some very important uh, implication of this result. Each mode has its own amplitude. So the amplitude depends on the mode. So if I have different modes, I have different amplitudes. For example, if you look at the light that comes here into the room, then presumably it has more yellow than blue. Is it correct? I definitely know that this is correct for the sun. For if you look at the sun, if you are outside, you have more yellow than than blue, right? Because the maximum, the, the black body radiation of the sun is centered around yellow. Okay? So you have more yellow and you have less red and less blue 
inside the sum. What does it mean? It means that each mode has its own amplitude. The yellow amplitude is bigger than the red amplitude. Okay? The energy in each, uh, <coughs> in each omega is conserved, and that's called the superposition principle. What does it mean? It means that if I produce uh, some electromagnetic radiation with some specific frequency, it stays forever. In general, we know that we have energy conservation in a system. But when we talk about uh, electromagnetic waves, we found that actually each mode has its own uh, frequency, if its own energy conserved. There's no energy moved from one uh, mode to another, and that's called the, the, <coughs> the superposition principle. So let me ask you the following question. Are the statements are exact? Do we really have superposition principle in, in electromagnetics waves? That is, if I have a yellow light and another yellow light come in, can they actually collide and create like whatever, four red photons or something like this? Can we or cannot we? We do. Cool, huh? Do we see it in Maxwell equation? Ah, good. OK. So of course, Maxwell equation tell us that that's what we have. And we know that Maxwell equation is not the end of the story because what's happened? Because at the UV, we have something else going on, which calls quantum mechanics. And it's actually violate those kind of assumptions. Good. So we know the superposition principle is a classical statement, which is extremely good for photons at these energies. OK? But when we have some starts to have higher energy photons, they actually have a very large chances to actually interact. Roughly speaking, at what energy of photon you think they will have start having a significant probability to interact? You see the question? Yes. The mass of the electron roughly at 1 MeV. So if I have 1 MeV photon, the cross-section becomes significant. And without doing any calculation, it's just the physics that we understand that the cutoff has to do with the mass of the electron. So that's where we should start seeing some significance. OK. So how do we deal with, the, with generic field theory? So we all know how to do classical electromagnetism. And now I want to actually ask what I do with generic field theories. OK. So generic field theory is, is basically that we have many, many number of degrees of freedom. Okay? So the way I like to think about my field is at any point, I have like an oscillator. So it's basically like take a harmonic oscillator in classical mechanics and make it many, many degrees of freedom. And I call them infinite, although sometimes they are totally finite. Okay? So if I talk about the temperature, the temperature is a field, but clearly it has a finite number of degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom do I have when I talk about the temperature of the Earth? A lot, something like 10 to the 50. But it's finite, it's not infinite. But I approximate it by the infinite number, OK? And the way I solve uh, classical field theory is really like we did mechanics. So in mechanics, I have my, my, my fundamental thing where x and y as a function of t, that's what I wanted. And here is phi of x and t is what I want, OK? So in, in, classical, in classical mechanics, x is what I want, and x is a function of t. In field theory, phi is what I want, and x and t are my parameters. Okay? And it's also kind of cool because in relativity, x and t are the same. They are part of, of a Lorentz space, of Minkowski space. So let me ask you the following question. So you know when we study relativity, we usually say the following statement. We say that uh, time is another space dimension. And instead of xi, we promote xi to become x mu. But there's this other way, which is totally equivalent. It's just philosophical. And I said, instead of thinking of time as an extra space dimension, why don't I think about space as extra time dimensions? OK? So one will say, well, you know, there's three space and one time. So you know, let's take the minority and make them into the majority. But maybe there's actually a good reason to think about xi to become the t mu. Do you ever do you have an opinion about what is better, x mu or t mu? So of course we all you never I, I assume. Anybody saw this notation t mu before? No, huh?
Yeah, so it's kind of obvious because you say three becomes, so going from three to four, it's kind of easy. Going from one to four, it's not so easy. And the reason it's not only just one to four, because one is, is really a scalar and four is a vector. So why the hell I want to do this instead of doing this, right? But if I was, you know, a lot of things happen in, in the history of science because of the way it's history. But if it was up to me and someone said, hey, Yuval, you can rewrite all the notation of the words, okay? So first, I would not use beta for 25 things, right? There would be only one thing that's called beta. But <coughs> the other thing that I would do, I would not call it X mu, I will call it T mu. Because for me, when I think about space-time as T mu, it makes my life so much simpler than I thought about them as, as X mu. And the reason is as following. So think about mechanics. So in mechanics, what I do, I say, my action is the integral over dt. And when I move to, to field theory, is the, <coughs> is the thing that appears, it's x of t. And in field theory, it's phi of t mu. Okay? So field theory for me is instead of, in mechanics, I have one time. And in field theory, I have four times. Okay? The, the, the role of time in classical mechanics is the same role as x mu in field theory. Do you see it? X mu is just the parameter, it's just the, the argument of a function. So in classical mechanics, I have X of T. T is just the argument of X, and X is what I want. And in, in field theory, I have phi of X mu. Or it's better if I could have said phi of T mu. And if it's phi of T mu, then I just see just extra time. And I, do the inter I integrate over them. Okay? So if you're okay with this, I'm still going to call it X mu, just because everybody else do it. But I really think that thinking about space-time as four time dimension, for me, it's really much simpler. It makes my life much simpler when I go to, to field theory. So that's what I was saying. In field theory, in mechanics, all I need to do is I do S is the integral of L dt. And now, when I go to field theory, I don't have only one time. I have, say, if I have a string, in a string, I have two times. The two times are called t and x, OK? So I do S, instead of the integral of L dt, I have integral of L dx dt. And L is what a function of what? In classical mechanics, L is a function of x and x dot. But now I have two times. The other time is called x. And now it's a function of phi, phi dot, and phi prime. You see it? It's just a generalization of many times system, OK? And if we have Lorentz invariance, so in Lorentz invariance, I have integral of L d4x, because I have four times, OK? And the Lagrangian is a function of phi and all the four time derivatives. And the four time derivatives are usually uh, d mu phi. OK? So you see, the way I think about field theory is just a generalization of classical mechanics. It's the same thing when you go from calculus to multivariable calculus. Instead of having one time, I now have four times. And that's it. You OK with this? I'm sure many of you have seen it before. It's not new for many of you. But I really hope that we understand that this is all what we are doing. So just if we really understand classical mechanics, moving to field theory, it's not such a big deal. Just have four times rather than one. OK? OK, so what we do, we have the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is the generalization of the Euler-Lagrange equation. So instead of having just dl to d phi dx dot, I also have the dl to the phi 1. There's also a minus sign that has come from the metric, because it's Minkowski space. And then that's how I write it in relativistic notation. OK? So we're done. So remember when we talked about mechanics, I tell you, just tell me the Lagrangian and I know everything. Now it's the same with field theory. Just tell me the Lagrangian and I know everything. The only thing that you have to do is, well, there's two things you have to do. So one thing is that actually when you do classical mechanics, x has to do with moving in real space. And now my, what I really care about is not moving in real space. It's some field, which it might be some a little bit more abstract than the position of a particle. That's one thing. That's a, one abstraction that I'm doing, is that instead of asking the position of a particle, I ask a value of something at any point in space-time. And the other thing that I actually, instead of working in one time dimension, I work in usually four time dimensions, or Minkowski space. OK? So we're done with classical field theory? Good. I really like this course because every 20 minutes I finish a whole course. In. <laughs> OK. So let's take an example. For example, a free field theory. A free field theory is just a generalization of a free particle. A free particle only has a kinetic term. It's just 
mv squared over 2. So now, instead of having x derivative, I must have also an x derivative, because I have two times, right? So the Lagrangian, the kinetic term of a, field theory, of a free field, is just d mu phi squared, OK? And that's my Lagrangian. And using the euler lagrange equation, I get this very, very famous equation called the wave equation. So the wave equation of, of field theory is the generalization of an <coughs> ma equal to 0 of classical mechanics. OK? It's just the same. You just take a free Lagrangian, apply the euler lagrange equation, and get the equation. So the field theory, the, the Wave equation of electromagnetism is the same as A equals 0 in classical mechanics. OK? Very good. <coughs> so <coughs> that was field theory. Now I want to start talking about harmonic oscillators. And first I want to ask like, the following trivial question. Why the hell we care so much about harmonic oscillators? How many times did you learn harmonic oscillators? So I try to remember. So um, <clears throat> when I started doing physics, I was learning it once. Then when I was in university, I learned it in intro mechanics. Then I learned it in advanced mechanics. Then I learned it in a whole thing that's called like fields and waves. And then I went to quantum mechanics one, and I learned it. I went to quantum mechanics two, and I still learn harmonic oscillators. And then you go to quantum field theory, and I still learn harmonic oscillators. And then, you know, 20 years later, you're a professor. What you do, you just choose harmonic oscillators. So that's a really amazing thing at what we do in physics. So why the hell we care so much? So at one point, I said that when I was in, in high school, I said, that's what physicists are doing. They have this big pendulum in the room, and they watch the pendulum the whole day, <laughs> right? Why the hell we care so much about harmonic oscillators? I mean, if you think about how much you learn about harmonic oscillators, it looks like totally crazy how much. Why we care so much about it? Because it is an approximation for everything. That's really nice, OK? And that's another statement that I'm really proud of myself of saying it. I met. Uh, it was like some really high upscale in the administration of Cornell of my university. And you know those things that you have like, you have to practice it. You have like one minute to meet one of those big people and you have to make sure you make the good impression of them because next time when they need to move like $3 million to the physics department, they will have a good thing about it. And they ask, okay, so what you are doing? I say, oh, I'm, I'm, a phys I, you know, I'm in the physics department. I say, so what, what is physics for you? And I came with this, I'm really proud of myself. Said, physics is the art of approximation. Have you heard this before? I really, really like it. I mean, physics is the art of approximation, OK? Because actually, if you think about it, we never care about exact results. It's really, OK, we're proud of the fact that we can never care about exact results. We are not mathematicians. We only care about being sloppy. So it's really nice. OK, so it's the art of approximation. And how do we do approximations? As a physicist, what do you do when you, OK? You see some system, and you say, oh, I only care about small perturbation around the minimum, right? Have you stated this statement before? Yes, good. And then sometimes you care about other things, and then you say, well, I don't know what to do. But if you care about small perturbation around the minimum, well, what do you do? You find the minimum, which sometimes is far from a trivial statement. But let's say it's, an, it's a trivial statement. You find the minimum, and well, what do you do? You expand. That's why we love Taylor so much, right? Because he taught us how to expand. And then we expand, and then what do you do? You truncate. Right? <laughs> That's what we do. We expand and truncate. Yes? And where well, do we truncate? Usually as early as possible. <laughs> right? And where is it? It's the harmonic terms. Right? And then we are so happy because we can study harmonic oscillator for years and we never have actually to worry about what we neglected. Right? So that's really the answer. The answer is that when we have a small parameter, and it's not always the case, but in many times when we do have a small parameter, that's what we do in physics. We find the minimum, we expand around the minimum, and we truncate. And the leading order result is the harmonic term. Okay? A generic potential, the first result around the minimum is the x squared. What about the, the constant? The constant we never care about. What about the linear term when we expand in the Taylor expansion? It is 0 because it's a minimum. So that we know. That, so the first term that is non-vanish is the x squared. And not only that, in order for this to be a minimum, then the coefficient has to be positive. 
right? If it's negative, then it's a maximum, and I don't want to expand around maxima. I want to expand around minimum, OK? Very good. <coughs> because almost any function around its minimum can be approximated as an harmonic function, OK? So that's really the reason that uh, we are doing it. So it's very important to identify small parameter, expand, and truncate, OK? And once we understand that that's what we are doing, actually, it has an important implication for our understanding of quantum field theory and particle physics, OK? So let's do the classical harmonic oscillator. The potential is just uh, some number time x squared. We solve it, and we find that the solution is just a cosine omega t, where omega is a function of my k and m. And we find here a really cool result that the period doesn't depend on the amplitude, OK? And that the energy is conserved. So when I have an harmonic oscillator, the energy is conserved. You know this two statement? Yes. Which of them is exact and which of them is approximate? Both of them exact, both of them approximate. In a real pendulum, what's going on? The first is or not? Is. Yes. First is exact and second is not. So we have actually four options. <laughs> right? <laughs> So let's talk, let's talk first about energy. Is energy conserved in general, in nature? Yeah. Yes, good. So what can make this statement not correct? If I actually, I neglect thing like friction, but then, of course, energy is conserved, it just gets out of my system, OK? So energy is conserved in the total, in the correct, absolute way. But if I actually take a physical pendulum, the energy of the pendulum actually, there is, always some decay, because some of the energy do go outside in terms of friction, OK? But fundamentally, energy is conserved. What about the second statement, that the, um, that the period doesn't depend on the amplitude? One day, my son came back from school. I think he was in 11th grade, and he took some physics. And he said, oh, my teacher told me today that it doesn't depend on the amplitude. And, I said, and she said it's an approximation. No, no, she said it's exact. Say, no, no, yeah, come on. I mean, ask her tomorrow. I mean, she must. And, you know, he went and he said, oh, it's some problem. He said, no, 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 it's, it's exact. And I was like, ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? What, what his teacher neglected that she didn't understand that she neglected? Large angle. Large angle, very nice. What are we doing? OK, it's a very famous expansion. It's the expansion of the, <laughs> I learned it. I'm very impressed with this. It's the sign of the sine function, <laughs> right? <laughs> remember sine of theta is theta. Anybody remember? La, no? Let's talk about the sine first. Is it plus or minus? Good. What is the? Nice, we all know, just from symmetry argument. And here's some number, right? What the number should be? Hmm? Three factor of six, which is a perfect number, so that's how I remember it. Anyway, so it's the sine function. It's the sine function. So, of course, this is the extra term that uh, is there, and this term actually makes the amplitude, the, the, the period depend on the amplitude. Okay? Well, let me ask you a little different question, which is a little bit of a detour from what I'm having, doing here, is that when you have a relation like that uh, either the period doesn't depend on the amplitude, it should remind you some kind of a degeneracy, right? It just say that all the, all the things have the same frequency independent on the amplitude, right? I have many, many amplitudes and always the same frequency, OK? So there must be some symmetry that guarantees it. You know what is the symmetry that guarantees that the amplitude doesn't depend on, that the, free, that the, brr, that the period doesn't depend on the amplitude? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Do you see that it should be? Right, so if, I, if energy is conserved, if I, I said the energy doesn't depend on, on the movement, there's a symmetry. That's t go to t plus c. What is the symmetry that's guaranteed that the period doesn't depend on the amplitude? I leave you with this. If you don't know the answer, please think about it. Please, please, please. And good that we have this homework session, and I want you to think about it. Because if I give you the answer, you, you lose all the fun. OK, I really want you to think about it. And you can talk to your friends. Please look and say, what is the symmetry that guarantees it? OK, 
So now I want to move to coupled oscillators. And <laughs> what I have here in the picture, so this is a picture actually taken from uh, <laughs> where I, I did my undergrad, my, under, my grad study. And that's a picture of a coupled oscillator. You see here a swing, and here's a swing, okay? And those are connected by another spring in, in top, okay? And when I was a grad student, I was going and giving tools to kids coming from school. And the way we teach kids from school about coupled oscillator is like this. We put one kid on this swing, okay? And we put another kid on this swing. And I ask this kid not to move, okay? And I take the other kid and I do like this. And then I said one, two, three. I do this usually in Hebrew, okay? And I say boom, and it lets go. And then what happened? Can you describe me the system? What's really going, what's really happening? Actually, it's a YouTube video. I should have brought the YouTube video, okay? So what happened is the following. So one kid starts to oscillate with some amplitude that depends on my initial condition, okay? And then, because of this spring in the top, some energy moves to the other kid. So this kid goes like this, and then this kid kind of stop, and then the other kids get a maximum amplitude, and then this kids kind of stop, and they... I, I really should... You saw it in... Maybe you didn't see it with kids. Maybe you see it with... Uh, you know, some other things that have mass. The kids have more than mass, so it's only one property. Okay, so they have, and they, so what's really going on? What is actually going on is that I have kind of energy in this that move into this. So the energy actually moves from one to the other because they are coupled, okay? But then you actually know what are the things that do not move, and the two things that do not move are the, what energy, what things do not move energy from one to the other? These are the normal modes, right? And then actually some of the kids that are advanced enough, we do this uh, normal mode things, okay? It's not exact because this is, you know, it's not a system, but how I do it, I ask a friend to go with me to the same amplitude and I leave them. And then the both kids do like this without anything. And then we do the other way, which is a little harder, that I hold the kids and then the other friends drop the, and when the kid is at the maximum, then I leave them and we get into this, Symmetric mode, and we go to the anti-symmetric mode. And in the anti-symmetric mode, the kids just go like this, as if there's actually nothing in between, okay? So we know what it is. It's the normal mode. It's the famous normal mode that we have. Each normal mode is not local. It's not like a regular pendulum that is here. The normal mode is something that is over the whole system. It involves the two pendulum. It's this generalized coordinate that we have. And the energy in each mode is conserved. And of course, the fact that the energy in each mode is conserved is as always just an approximation. And if I have some higher order terms like this, then it actually moves energy from one to the other. So what actually tells me how much energy moves from one mode to another? What tells me what moves from one mode to the other is the coupling between them. It's the higher order term. It's the thing that are not quadratic, they are not x squared or y squared, the thing that go like, say, x squared y. And the larger this alpha is, there's more energy that moves between one mode to the other. <coughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> See, it's kind of, kind of a very bad picture, right? <laughs> so what I want you to think about, and I really want you to think about the relation between fields and harmonic oscillators, okay? And we already talked about it that I see fields as, as a generalization of harmonic oscillators, but I really want you to understand, try to think for yourself, talk to some of the people that you meet here, so to, and ask what are really, what are, how we actually see fields as a generalization of harmonic oscillators. Okay, <coughs> and so the next thing I wanna do, after we're done with the uh, uh, simple harmonic oscillators, I wanna actually move to quantum mechanics. And once we understand the quantum mechanics of simple harmonic oscillators, we finally will be able to really get quantum field theory and we'll be done with quantum field theory course. Okay, so how do we do quantum mechanics? So there's many ways to do quantum mechanics and one way that we like to do quantum mechanics is we put a little hat above everything, right? So you take your system and you say my coordinate, my classical system has a, my degree of freedom is X and I make X into an operator and that's where I do quantum mechanics, right? And in order to solve quantum mechanics, we need to know phi of x and t. So you remember when we talked about classical mechanics, in order to solve mechanics, I need to find x of t. In order to solve quantum mechanics, I need to find psi of x and t. And psi of x and t is actually a field. You see that it is a field, it's a function of 
X and T, so it's a field. Um, how many, how many wave functions describe a system? So in, when I try to solve classical mechanics, I need to find X of all the particles. So if I have five degrees of freedom, I need to find X1 up to X5. In quantum mechanics, do I need, how many wave functions do I have? One. Okay, so very important. In, in, when we have, we have only one wave function that describe the whole system, okay? <clears throat> so, then we move on and do the quantum harmonic oscillator, and it's a really, really cool. We write the Hamiltonian, p squared over 2m plus m omega squared x squared. We got the spectrum. The spectrum is m plus half h bar omega. And then we use this amazing, cool trick, and we say, oh, the Hamiltonian can write as a dagger a, time h bar omega, where a and a dagger are x plus or minus ip. There's usually in the book, there's a lot of numbers and symbols before that. They are very confusing, and it's very good not to write them. If you really want them, you can go to the book and find them, but really just ignore them, okay? Of course, this must be wrong because there are different dimensions, so it must be wrong. But this is this sign. This sign is an extremely important sign in physics, right? It's about the sloppiness, right? So I want you to think about A and A dagger just as X plus IP, and X is basically just A and A dagger. So that's very abstract, right? X in classical mechanics is the position of a particle, and then in quantum mechanics, I write x as a sum of some a and a dagger, which are not even a mission, and they are just some something, okay? And then I call this a and a dagger creation and annihilation operator, and I say when I apply a on some state, I get n minus 1, and when I apply a day on n, I get n, n plus 1. This looks a little abstract. Why do I even care about those a and a daggers? Why we even introduce those A and A daggers? So when you introduce, when you did it, what was the professor telling you? Why are we introducing those A and A daggers? Because it's really cool to write it like this. It's like so much nicer than this. Why I cannot do a harmonic oscillator like this? I mean, I just write my Hamiltonian like this, and I solve it, and that's it. And I get this. And I get the wave function, and the wave function are whatever they are, the Hermit. Polynomial? Sorry? So this one. Yes, yeah, so one, one answer is totally nice, and it's just really cool abstract things that you can do. So you can do it like this, and you can do it with other things, and use a lot of little, really tricks, which are really cool mathematically. I totally agree. But there's some deeper reason that this one is we really like A and A dagger, that we want to use it, that it's extremely hard to do when I use this Hamiltonian. There's one reason that we, we really care about A and A dagger much more. Yeah, so that's what we say. We can actually solve the harmonic oscillator in all those, and that's totally correct. But there's one big reason that I want, yes? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So, so you are totally right. We can, there's so many little, really cool things. Like when you start doing this A and A dagger, it becomes like so abstract, right? You do all those, yes. Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. You kind of, you kind of in the direction I want to go. They allowed us to go from one state to another. But can we go from one state to another? Don't we say that when we have an harmonic oscillator, the energy is conserved? So if I start with, let's say I start with some. It allowed me to actually go from one state to another. So it allowed me to kind of build the Hilbert space. Very, very nice. you all going around the one thing that I really want. I, we can find matrix. You can find matrix then? Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Okay, let me come back. Let me come back to let me come back to quantization of, quantization of energy. Yeah, we can do it. Let me come back to the thing that I was telling you from the that I was I'm telling you the whole story that I you know I'm I'm very proud of myself that I was able to make a big contribution to science and I said that physics is the art of approximation. You remember this that I was telling you that I'm so proud of myself. Yes, so now that I told you that physics is that, why do we really care about A and A dagger so much? 
We really care about A and A dagger so much only when we really go beyond the harmonic approximation. In the harmonic approximation, to basically, if I really have just the harmonic approximation, I can do everything without ever mention A and A dagger. And you can play with A and A dagger forever. And it's very, very cool, but you don't learn anything new, like nothing new you learn from them. The time that you really learn so much is when we go beyond the leading, beyond the harmonic approximation. And did you do a perturbation theory with harmonic oscillators back then in undergrad or in grad? Did you? Some of you, some, maybe, I don't remember. Right? It was one homework, but I was sick that day. Right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, right? OK. So now I want to actually go and start doing a perturbation theory. And in perturbation theory, this A and A dagger become extremely useful. And they really, really, really going to give us the intuition that we need when we start doing quantum field theory. OK? <coughs> so <coughs> let's talk about coupled oscillators. I will come back to the A and A dagger soon. And let's think about this kind of thing. So I have my potential is this. And I have a, a coupling, alpha x, y. And this is a still harmonic. You see, it's harmonic in terms that it have only its second order in x and y. And the normal mode are this, the x plus minus y. And the two frequencies are k plus minus alpha. And I want to ask you the following question. What is the quantum mechanic? Oh, shit. Energy and spectrum of this system. Page 25 in my first typo. I think it's very impressive, no? <laughs> OK, what is the quantum mechanics energy and spectrum of this system? So please, I want to do the following. It's already more than one hour that I'm talking. I'll be quiet for one minute, and I want you, and you can talk to your friend around you. And if they're not your friend, that's a good time to make friends, OK? And actually, try to write the answer. So what I want an answer is as following. I want the answer like this. <clears throat> write it, write it down. I want to answer E with some indices here. I don't tell you how many indices. Equal to something. And I want you to write some ket with some indices. I'm not going to tell you how many. OK? So I want an energy and the brine and the ket of this. I'll be quiet for a minute. Please, everybody have uh, something to write or a computer? No? You should. When you come to a lecture, you should have a uh, a pen and a, a paper. Oh, I see many of you do have it. OK, so I'm asking, and if this equation is a little hard, let me ask first, what is the ground state? What is the ground state energy? So you know for a simple harmonic oscillator, is h bar omega over 2. What is the ground state energy of this one? Talk to you first. Start, yes. I want to hear. I want to hear this background noise, uh, uh, h bar omega. <laughs> please, please. I be, Yes, start talking so I can be quiet. Otherwise, it's amazing. <clears throat> Don't be shy. Talk. Ask you prayer. Do you know the answer? <laughs> so next time, I know you will sit alone. That's <laughs> I should have told you in the beginning to make sure you have. But still right, right? OK, so can someone tell me the ground state energy? Just the ground state energy. H bar, nice, good start. Yes, H bar time. OK, let me keep going. <laughs> right. Anybody? Someone, be, be brave. It's, it's, believe me, it's, 
You have to be brave to talk in, th in front of 150 people. <laughs> Someone? No, I don't. Yes? Alpha over M? So let's open a parenthesis. What is it? One minus alpha over M. <laughs> Not really. Good, good, but you know, the, the fact that you were brave enough to actually talk, it's, it's good because <clears throat> it's not so trivial. Anybody else? Hmm? Omega plus plus omega minus, very nice. Omega plus plus omega minus. Very nice, so let me explain why it is. So basically, we know in quantum mechanics, we know in, in, in general in physics, when we have two harmonic oscillators, we can treat each of them separately. That's the big deal about harmonic oscillators. That's the superposition principle that everything we learn about. And if I have only one system with just omega plus, the ground state energy is h bar omega plus over 2. If I have only omega minus, it's h bar omega minus over 2. And here I have two degrees of freedom. The two degrees of freedom are q plus minus. So this is the energy, the ground state energy of q plus, And this is the ground state energy of q minus. OK, so now how you generalize it to a general E? So the E, how many indices the E is? Two, let's call them n plus and n minus. OK, good, good. And now it's just the generalization. So each h bar over 2, um, uh, n plus omega plus plus n minus omega minus. And what is the state? So the state is n plus n minus. And what are n plus and n minus? These are just the standard harmonic oscillator, whatever the Hermit polynomial, or I don't remember what they are exactly. And what is the argument of the Hermit polynomial? Is, is it x1 or x2? What is the argument of this? Is the q plus. And the argument of this is the q minus. OK? Good. So we understand how we solve actually a system of coupled harmonic oscillators. The way we solve a system of coupled harmonic oscillators so that's what I was just writing. I wrote, so this, the way we solve a system of coupled harmonic oscillators, we move to the mode, to the eigen mode, and then we treat each mode as a separate harmonic oscillators, and then we just add their uh, energy, and we multiply the wave function to get the wave function of the total system. OK? Any questions on this? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's a really, really important part that's uh, Section 4 in Lambda Lifshitz. And it's really this, is the fact that when you have a Lagrangian that is separable, then you can actually treat each, part, each term of the Lagrangian as a separate system, such that the total thing is the, <laughs> is the sum of them. And when we go to quantum mechanics, the statement is the same. If you have a Hamiltonian or a Lagrangian that you can write the Hamiltonian as the sum of two, of two Hamiltonians, you can solve any Hamiltonian separately, and the wave function is the product of each wave function, and the energy is the sum. And that's a general, general statement in quantum mechanics. Oh, so that's, I, of course, the whole point is that I neglected the interaction. OK, I misunderstood the question. Of course, this is, a, the, this is in the harmonic approximation. Of course, this is an approximation. And we're proud of it, right? <laughs> yes, good. <clears throat> so how we actually move from this into fields, how this is related to field? So when I have one degree of freedom, I just say A. I just A and A dagger. When I have two degrees of freedom, I have A plus and A minus. When I have seven degrees of freedom, I can call them A1 up to A7. And when I have a field, let's say I have a string with many, many, many degrees of freedom, instead of having an index AI, I call it A of K. So K is just the, the continuous variable that is the generalization of the index. Do you see what I do here? If I have one harmonic oscillator, it's just A and A dagger. When I have two, I have two A's and two A daggers. When I have seven, I have seven A's and seven A daggers. When I have infinite, I have infinite A and infinite A daggers. But instead of calling them with an index I, I, give it an, I put it in a parenthesis and I call it K. So this K is just the continuous of approximation of the district number I. And what happened to the state? When I have one harmonic oscillator, I have N. When I have many, my state is n1, n2, like this. And when I have infinite, 
then it's become n as a function of k. I just have all of them. And what happened to the energy? I start with n plus half x bar omega. Then I have to sum over all the i's. And when I go to the continuum, instead of a sum, I have the integral. So that will be the integral. So you see how I think about a free field. A free field is as a set of infinite number of harmonic oscillators. And the reason is that I always expand around the minimum, and therefore I think about my field as a free field to an approximate. Okay? So now <coughs> let's move to quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, in when I think about harmonic oscillator, my x become an A and A dagger. So the position of the particle is this abstract thing that the position of the particle, I can think about it as creation and annihilation of state. When I go to quantum field theory, my field is an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So my field becomes infinite number of creation and annihilation operators. Do you see this statement? A field is nothing but many, many, many uh, harmonic oscillators. And since in quantum mechanics, harmonic oscillators are just creation and annihilation operators, that's what a quantum field is. X and T are just the generalization of time. So X and T are not, are not operators anymore in quantum mechanics. X mu becomes just T mu, it's just time. And the field itself is just generalization of X. And the generalization of X is just creation and annihilation. I know you heard it before, many of you, and if you never heard it before, you know, it's a little bit abstract, but that's how I want to think about field. It's very abstract to think about a position of a particle as creation and annihilation operator, okay? So it's a little more abstract to think about the electric field as creation and annihilation operator. And it's not one, it just happened to be infinite of them, okay? But it's just this, yes? So, no, no, no. So that's, so that's when I think about a mechanic system when I really care about position of a particle. But now I said a quantum field, I don't really care about the position of a, I, pay, I care about the electric field at some point. And the electric field is the equivalent of x in classical mechanics. And x and t, so the electric field E is a function of x and t. And x and t are actually playing the same role in the electric field, right? And that's something that you are very familiar when you solve the wave equation. You always see that x and t are so similar, right? So if you, think, if you solve the wave equation and you take a picture at a given time, you see a sign, okay? And if you do the other way, you stand at one point and you just measure the function of time, you also see the same function because x and t are so, so, so much the same. So the field is something abstract. It's like the electric field. It's the value of the electric field at this point, okay? At this x, x, at this x and t, okay? And it varies as a function of x, and it varies as a function of t. Okay? But it's the abstract thing, this phi, or the electric field. And then this electric field that is already kind of abstract, you make it more abstract, we say, oh, this electric field is actually a creation and annihilation operator of some arbitrary thing. But then there's some abstraction in the fact that, oh, electric field is actually light, which is very abstract. The moving of the electric field is light. So then when we talked about creation and annihilation operator, it's a little bit abstract. And you have to uh, accept abstraction at this point, and then we'll see where it leads us. Any more questions? OK, so let's move on. So then I ask you two, two questions. So now we try to understand what is a particle. So what is the energy that it takes to excite the harmonic oscillator by one level? And what is the energy of the photon? And that's something that we learn many times when you have two things that have the same answer, it's much easier to remember them. So what is the answer for this? So you all know it's the same answer. It's h bar omega. So h bar omega is the energy that it takes to excite the harmonic oscillator, and it's also the energy of the photon. And why it is the same answer? Why the fact that actually the, harmonic, the energy that it takes to excite the harmonic oscillator is the same as the energy of the photon? And the answer is that basically, oops, I wanted to do something impressive and it didn't work. Excitation of simple harmonic oscillator are what we call particles. And that's somewhat abstract, but I really, it's, it's not a very surprising fact, okay? So you already kind of see it from the fact that both of them H, H bar omega. But if I ask you what is, what is a particle, what is the photon? Say, well, what is the photon? The photon is the excitation of the electromagnetic field, right? That's what it is. And when I say I have five photons, that means that at this specific omega, 
my quantum mechanics level of this specific omega is at level five. That means that I have five photons. So I hope this is abstract, but that's really the way I like to think about a particle. So when I think about simple harmonic oscillator, and I say my harmonic oscillator is at level nine, I think about it as having nine particles in this state, okay? And then the name creation and annihilation operators actually make a lot of sense. Because when I create, when I go from three to four, and I give it an energy of h bar omega, I create one extra particle. So it is abstract, but it's no more abstract than what you are familiar with light. The fact that we say that light is excitation of the electromagnetic field, in a way, is very abstract, right? This light is, you know, you, you really see it. You see it in your eye, right? Because our eye is a detector of light. But then we say, oh, this light that we see is just excitation of the electromagnetic field, OK? And the electromagnetic field, to a very good approximation, is just given by a set of infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So light is just excitation of harmonic oscillators, right? So then if I want to quantize light, what I need to do? I said, oh, it's just harmonic oscillator. So quantize the light, it just quantize the harmonic oscillators. And then the photon, which is the basic quantity of light, is just the excitation, one excitation of harmonic oscillators. OK? So that's the statement that, as I said, I know that many of you heard before, is the fact that particles are basically just excitation of uh, harmonic oscillators, or basically they are excitation of the field, OK? So the way I like to think about particles, particles are excitations of harmonic oscillators. And the harmonic oscillator are my fundamental fields. OK, we all know what particles are, so we can move on. But ask me more questions if there's anything. <coughs> so <coughs> what about masses? So when we talk about photons, photons have, uh, they are massless. So now we can actually play the game. And I was telling you all the excitation of simple harmonic oscillators. And now we can actually do more things that are more advanced. And for example, what I want to do, I take my Lagrangian. I can start adding terms to my Lagrangian. I can take my Lagrangian. That's the, my, that's the, the free field Lagrangian. That is the one that gives me photons. And I can add this extra term. And when I add this extra term, what I find out is that I still have free particles, but these free particles have mass. Yes. Oh, <clears throat> so of course, eventually, we kind of think about it as the, the gauge symmetry, OK? But at this stage, you can think about just phi go to phi plus c, like just translation. So that's the same symmetry that guarantees that you have uh, free particles, OK? But I'm not actually going there yet. So I add this, this uh, state, the m squared plus phi squared. And what you find that this one actually gives you a massive particle. How do I know that it's a massive particle? Because for massless particle, from this, I get omega is equal to k. And for massive particle, I get omega squared equal to k squared plus m squared. And what I'd like you to do, I call it homework. But of course, you know, we are not at home here. But what I mean is that it's something to do after the lecture. So what I, want, what I would ask you to do, and that we're going to discuss it tomorrow in the uh, solution session, is actually to actually prove it. That is, you take your, you guess a solution. And by guess a solution, it's, you know, you, get the, you guess the correct solution. You take this guess, plug it back in, and you see that this solution actually satisfies this equation, and it gives you this relation. Omega squared equals k squared plus n squared. And you know that omega is energy, and k is just momentum. And this gives you e squared equals p squared, p squared plus n squared, which describe a particle with mass m. OK? So please write it down and try to actually do this with the other question that I asked you. So <coughs> what about some other terms? So the other terms, I can actually add something like lambda phi to the 4. So what's happening is I, you see what I'm doing. Actually, I should, I should back up. So what I did is the following. I start with field theory, and I have my Lagrangian for field theory. And the first Lagrangian that I did was the free Lagrangian that gave me the wave equation that we all know and love, that gave me the uh, like electromagnetic radiation. And then I add this extra term. And this extra term is still a free particle in the sense that the energy is conserved, but the dispersion relations are such that it's heavy mass. And now I said I can keep adding terms to my Lagrangian. Why not? Actually, why not? What is the thing that forbid me? Oh, so actually normalization is the one that tells you phi to the 6. But actually, I don't care too much about normalization. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Basically, if there's no symmetry that forbid me to add a term, I will add this term, right? So now. I can add, for example, lambda phi to the 4. 
And then I plug it into the Euler Lagrange equation, and I get the following relation. I get this kind of an equation. Now, if I don't have this term, then the solution is very easy. And that's what I was just telling you, just e to the i something, you plug it back in, and you see everything. That's what I ask you to do. But this I cannot do. Why I cannot do it? Because it's nonlinear. And basically, we don't know how to solve nonlinear differential equation. Yes? Oh, so in principle, I should add everything, right? So I just say, I, as an example, I add just 5 to the 4, just, just for the sake of the example. But of course, I don't really yet dare how to build the Lagrangian. We're going to talk it to, to much length, OK? The point I want to make is that I actually I cannot solve this equation because it's nonlinear. So how do I do? What do I do when I get stuck? We always do the same thing, right? We do an approximation, ta, ta, ta. So what do I do in this case? How do I solve this equation? So I assume that lambda is small. So basically, I said, if lambda is small, I know what to do, right? <laughs> yes? So then I say, well, let's assume that lambda is small. And then if lambda is small, what I do? I do perturbation theory. I said, let's start with lambda equal to 0. Then I solve the, the, the system and come back. So let me end the lecture by a short summary, and then tomorrow we'll continue from this point. So what I was kind of doing with you, we kind of do a little review of uh, your all three years of undergrad physics. And what we did is the following. I emphasized to you that fields are generalization of simple harmonic oscillators. And I really want this point to get really in us, because the, the, the reason that we care so much about harmonic oscillators to when we do particle physics and high-energy physics, is that our fields are just this. They are just harmonic oscillators, OK? They are much, much more abstract harmonic oscillators, but that's what they are. They are harmonic oscillators, OK? And then we talked about the fact that particles are just this excitation of the harmonic oscillators. And what I want, I want my Lagrangian to describe the system, OK? And my Lagrangian is given in terms of fields. The fields are the generalization of the coordinate in classical mechanics, OK? So that's why it's not surprising at all that I can write field as creation and annihilation operator. It's nothing but x of classical mechanics. And our aim in particle physics is to find the Lagrangian, is to find L, OK? We can only solve the linear case, so we only know how to do simple harmonic oscillators. And that's why I develop all those formalism. And now we actually have to start and moving into the perturbation theory. So <coughs> what we're going to do, so what I would ask you is that I gave you a few little questions throughout the, the lecture. Please try to, to think about them. Write them uh, <coughs> I should have actually summarized them, but I didn't. But actually, what I, I will give this, uh, we can post them, right? We can post my lecture. So I will post them, and then you see the few questions I ask. And we're going to discuss them tomorrow. And the last thing I want to say, please, please, please come and talk to me. I love to talk much more about everything of this. OK, so I guess I see you in lunch and tomorrow and all this. Thanks.